Hello, Alexander III of Macedon, better known as Alexander the Great, is one of the most famous figures from the ancient world. Born in 356 BC, he became king aged 20 after his father Philip had been murdered. Alexander then went on to kill all his rivals and secured the throne. Over the next 12 years, he marched his army more than 12,000 miles as he conquered the Persian Empire and defeated its king Darius III. He spread Greek culture through Central Asia and found his cities, among them Alexandria in Egypt. At its peak, his empire stretched from Greece in the west to modern-day Pakistan in the east, taking in what we know as Iran, Iraq and Egypt and Afghanistan. He is widely regarded as one of the most skillful and influential leaders and military commanders of all time. With me to discuss Alexander the Great are Paul Cartledge, Emeritus Professor of Greek Culture at A.G. Levantis, Senior Research Fellow at Clare College, University of Cambridge, Diana Spencer, Professor of Classics at the University of Birmingham, and Rachel Mayer's Lecturer in Classics at the University of Reading. Paul Cartledge, what was the status of Macedon in the Greek world at the time when Alexander was born in 356 BC? Down to the end of the 5th century BC, so in other words, um, within 70 or so years of Alexander's birth, Macedonia was just a geographical expression. There was a kingship. It was based in what we call Lower Macedonia, Eastern Macedonia, at Pella, but it was not a strongly unified kingdom. It was on the fringe, and it wasn't until Alexander's father, Philip II, that Macedon, the kingdom of Macedon, became a major player in Greek politics. Politics. And what did he do? Philip. Mm. Well, first of all, he had to strongly unify the two halves of his uh, geographical base, the west and the east, the upland west, the lowland east, which he did. Having done that, having introduced, I'm being very brief here, major military reforms, having got the barons, as we like to call them, of upland Macedonia on his side, he then had huge ambitions, first to conquer, to become the dominant power in what we call Old Greece, that is the, the southern Balkan Peninsula and some of the Aegean area as well, with a view to now, this is where historians start to disagree, did he always have in mind, was he aiming towards the big project, which was an Asiatic campaign against Persia, the great Oriental power, as it had been for 200 years, or did that come to him fairly late on in his uh, thinking? Alexander's... Uh Family back. His mother, can you tell us about his mother? He's one of yeah. the seven wives of Philip. Yes, Philip. Um, now, this is some, I mean, we're going to talk later, I'm sure, about how Greek were the Macedonians or how typically Greek were. They, in my opinion, they are they're certainly Greek. But they had practices which are not common, and one of them was monog not monogamy amongst the royal family. Greeks were typically monogamous, and they d used that to distinguish themselves from non Greeks who are not necessarily monogamous. Philip um, was said to have fought his his um, campaigns by marriages, one of the um, historians of Philip, a biographer of Philip, and in all, as you rightly say, he had seven. Now, whether they were all formally married as wives, that, that's an issue. But the mother of Alexander, Olympias, Olympias, we normally say, she came from Epirus, Epirus, to the west, and she was his either third or fourth um, spouse in some sense, but Crucially, she produced the first male heir, and that's Alexander the Great. So what sort of court, was it, did he have a court, what sort of well, background did the young uh, Alexander experience? Well, you can imagine, with more than one female uh, potentially vying for influ influence, with Olympias coming from outside, and herself having a very proud um, self-ascribed ancestry, descended from Achilles, no less, uh, and Philip claimed to be descended from Heracles, so imagine the combination of those two. It was said to be a love match, and most of us believe that's purely fictional, that actually it's a very um, utilitarian marriage because um, she brought certain things to Macedonia that Macedonia lacked. But at any rate, Alexander would have grown up amongst um, a court that was somewhat in schism, to put it mildly, and different wives, different children being born, who's going to come out top? And you mentioned that Philip was assassinated. Well, it's no secret that Olympias and Alexander too were implicated. In other words, there were sources that believed that they had a hand in Philip's assassination. Rachel Mass, can we take the childhood of um, Alexander a bit further? How would he have been educated uh, at the time? In what would he have been educated? And so on. 
Well, Alexander, in a lot of ways, had the best education money could buy at that time. His tutor, from probably around the age of 13, was famously the renowned uh, philosopher Aristotle, who was a pupil of Plato uh, in Athens, but who was also of a Macedonian background himself. He was from a city called Stagera, which had been overrun and partially destroyed by Philip. Um, and its population sold into slavery. So Aristotle is supposed to, in return for his tutorship of Alexander, received uh, benefits and preferential treatment for his own home city as well. Um, Alexander was brought up and educated with a very close group of young noble Macedonian friends and companions of the same age. And we find among these figures who would subsequently go on to be very important in the history of Alexander's campaign, such as Ptolemy, who later became king of Egypt, and Hephaestion, who was Alexander's closest friend and companion. What Alexander got from Aristotle and from his general tutorship as a young man was a very strong sense of the the cornerstones of a Greek cultured education. So he was trained in philosophy and he also naturally, like all good educated Greeks, knew his Homer very well. And the story of the Iliad was very important to him on his campaigns. He's supposed to have slept with a a copy of part of the Iliad under his pillow, as the story goes, and he developed a very strong association with Achilles. Um, And as Paul has already said, he can trace his descent to Achilles and Heracles, notionally. Well, Alexander's Achilles identification is very strong. Um, On his campaigns, he visits the site of the city of Troy, um, and this this is something which he um, yeah perceives a very very strong identification with. Having Aristotle as a tutor is beguiling. Uh, <laughs> can you tell us what sort of influence he had on the way he behaved and acted for the rest of his life? Well, there's the question, really. Um, one might like to think that Aristotle has a great opportunity here that he could shape a young Macedonian nobleman, someone from the traditionally the fringes of the civilised, I'm doing scare quotes, uh, Greek world, into uh, an ideal ruler. Um, It's not quite that way, but Aristotle and philosophical training that he gives Alexander is very influential in the way that he conducts himself and his relationship with Greek states as well. Uh, The story goes that when he visited the Greek city of Corinth, he went looking for the famous cynic philosopher philosopher Diogenes, who lived at Corinth. And Diogenes was not a philosopher in Aristotle's mode. He wasn't very social. He didn't work with a philosophical school. Um, He detached himself from what would have been considered civilised Greek society and uh, lived in a barrel outside the city walls. And the story goes that Alexander went and sought out the great philosopher so that uh, he could... um, pay respect to him and ask Diogenes if there was anything he could do for him. And Diogenes's reply to the great conqueror is, yes, could you please step to one side? You're blocking the sun. Can you tell us about the tension there had been? Let's say Alexander is in his teens now, but even before then, like between Greece and Persia, before Alexander then mm. come to his time. This is something that goes really as far back as you would care to trace it. Um, the, the famous Greek historian, the, the father of history, as it were, Herodotus, writing in the 5th century BC, sets out to trace the origins of tension between what he refers to as Greece and Asia. And Herodotus takes this back even in the 5th century BC, very, very far into the remote past. He says this is something that can be traced back to the time of the Trojan War, tension between the Aegean world and places to the east. We're not really in a position to verify how much of this this legend is, is factually accurate in any way, but what we do know a lot about in the 5th century BC are the wars which broke out between the Persian Empire, which was controlling most of what's the modern Middle East, Um, and also most of present-day Turkey, and the Greek states, which are not just in mainland Greece, but were in the greater Greek-speaking and settled world, which includes a lot of the western coast of modern-day Turkey. Um, The Persian Empire was expansionist. It took control of a lot of these Greek states uh, in western Anatolia, and in the 5th century BC, Um, Persian armies 
advance increasingly far into mainland Greece itself. Now, I'm sure listeners may have heard of famous battles such as Marathon, also Thermopylae. This is the, the, the kind of degree of um, threat that Persia poses to Greece. Uh, it's something that Greek states have worked very, very hard to fight off the Persian threat. Um, and this is really where Alexander's movements into the east enable him to cast himself as the avenger of Greece against Persia. Diana Spencer, how did Alexander come to power? We've talked about how his father, Philip, had many wives. One of the marriages, or relationships at least, with um, a woman called Cleopatra proved particularly insulting to, Phil to, um, to Alexander and his mother, Olympias. And one of our sources, Plutarch, actually talks in very vivid, exciting detail about the sense of, of wounded pride, but also political um, kind of cataclysm. That this, Why is that? Well, it, it seems as if there was a real sense in perhaps Alexander and his mother's mind that they were not of pure Macedonian descent. Alexander his mother. Alexander was. and his mother. His mother comes from uh, Epirus, as, as Paul mentioned. So Alexander, although Philip is his father, and of course a good Macedonian background, he's not entirely Macedonian. Cleopatra is a Macedonian new queen, potentially, who of course could become a, a rallying point for some of the more disaffected nobles in those various um, political factions that, that we mentioned. With so she's a threat to his, sorry, excuse me. No. She's a threat to his succession. Yes, I think that that's clearly um, the bottom line. And I think some of the later historians have wanted to embroider this with a kind of psychological perspective, perhaps. But I think, I think the political fact is it looks as though this could be a moment when a new male heir, a male heir who could be characterised as purely Macedonian, might be on the cards. So this, this wedding seems to have provoked something um, of a crisis for Alexander and his mother. And in fact, his mother heads away from Pella, from the Macedonian court. And Alexander himself seems to have taken on what, what we would think of as a, a six-month self-imposed exile, in effect, in which he, he sulked, perhaps, one, one might say, being a little bit more psychological anyway, about it. And you the assassination of his father yep, so by he, a so-called bodyguard. By a so-called bodyguard. So he, he comes back. Things are sort of patched up, but the relationship, one would imagine, has has lost perhaps the integrity of a, a kind of a, an heir apparent and his father relationship that um, that might have been originally conceived of. When Cleopatra's daughter is getting married, so she's being married in um, uh, Epirus, Philip goes to the wedding. So they're celebrating the wedding, and one of his bodyguards, Pausanias, is supposedly kills him. Now he very conveniently is killed whilst escaping or attempting to escape. So nobody really knows the rights and wrongs of that story, but it's, it's thought that Alexander and his mother might have been involved. And th this is really where it comes back to that, that slightly otios context I was setting, that whilst one might think, why would Alexander, the fantastic heir apparent, kill his father at this particular moment? Well, I think the answer is because this is a moment where he can perhaps cut the, the, the danger off, the danger of a new heir who is a Macedonian coming into the picture. And how did he secure, having that assassination having occurred, how did he secure his position and grab the throne? Well, unfortunately, perhaps from a modern perspective, he, um, he does it by killing most of his rivals. Um, he did spare his half-brother, Philip Aridaeus, but all all of the rest of the potential threats, cousins and half-siblings, are all executed, um, some rather gruesomely, in fact. Quite early on, he seems to have decided that he would invade the Persian Empire. Do, do we know anything about, in this hazy evidence uh, world that he lives in, do we have any notion of when that might have happened or why that might have happened to this 20-year-old? Um, I mean, I, th I think, to my mind, it, it ties in with some of the things that both Rachel and Paul were saying earlier, and in, and in particular, this, this sense that he believed himself, or at least was represented as believing himself, as having a descent from two very significant figures who have close connections with the East, and that's Hercules, or Heracles in the Greek world, um, and Achilles. And both of those figures, I think, playing a significant part in his very Greek education under Aristotle, are likely to have in some way formed a, a self-conception for him that, that you know, there could be a civilizing mission, a mission for somebody who's more than a military figure. Paul, before you uh, 
please, sir. I'm just going to add um, that um, Philip was assassinated, having already um, formed an organisation in Greece, the first objective of which was to appoint him to lead this pan-Hellenic expedition, as Rachel said, of revenge. And so, therefore, if Alexander, as I believe, was not part of Philip's plans, well, what you're, you've just been talking about, him fulfilling the desire to emulate uh, Achilles, he just wouldn't have been in Asia. Yeah. And so I think that's another quite powerful reason why he might have thought, mm, it wouldn't be a bad thing if Philip was got out of the way so that I could lead this expedition, which, by the way, had already started yeah. by the time Philip was assassinated. And he sets off on this, uh, becomes legendary, we can use that word with authority on this in this occasion, uh, so. march across. And, <laughs> and one of his greatest feats, we're told, was the capture of Tyre. The yeah. Phoenician city of Tyre. Can you tell us about that, Paul? Well, you mentioned at the beginning that he is um, most famous, probably, for being uh, the, one of the absolutely five-star or multi-star generals of, of the whole world. I mean, not just ancient Greece. He's up there with probably Napoleon, perhaps Genghis Khan. There are hardly any others who have his record of no defeats. And so um, he seems to have um, been one of the absolutely extraordinary people. And one of his talents, as a general, was to adapt to different situations. So he didn't just win pitched battles, which is tough enough, but he also captured mountain fortresses uh, up many thousands of feet in the snow, etc., etc. Now, the Tyre siege is, I think, his most interesting siege. It's particularly brutal. Um, he's fighting here the Phoenicians, who live in what's now Lebanon, or what's left of Lebanon, and they performed the role of being the navy of the Persian. Empire. So he takes a very odd decision to fight the, the, the enemy's um, fleet by land. He dismisses his own ships. In other words, he's going to take successively their bases, and he has to take them by land. Well, unfortunately for him, Tyre, ancient Tyre, was on an island. So in order to even reach this fortified island city, he has to build a huge causeway, and it's the basis today of the fact that uh, ancient Tyre is linked to the mainland, because it's that causeway which um, links to the mainland. So it took him seven months. These were fiercely resistant, and it involved um, developing all sorts of new kinds of weaponry and defence against weaponry, etc., etc. But to me, the key thing is this, that before the um, the siege finally uh, concluded. A number of Phoenician rulers of other cities than Tyre deserted the Phoenicians and therefore de deserted the Persian Empire and came over to Alexander. They recognised that here was a force. Alexander was, well, as they often called him in Greece, invincible. And now what he did after the siege was um, very, very questionable. He often operated, and this goes back to his father, I don't want anybody ever again to resist me in the way this particular city has done. So you make an example of them. You destroy their city, in the case of Olynthus, or in the case of Thebes, or in this case, you massacre, you um, crucify large numbers of your enemy in public, on the shore, and this is extremely horrible. Crucifixion is a most unpleasant uh, mode of um, killing an enemy. But the point is, never again, guys, resist me like the Tyrians resisted me. Rachel Myers, how was the Persian Empire governed and how did it, was it prepared for this invasion? The Persian Empire is, well, as the name suggests, it's r ruled by an emperor who is of Persian descent and uh, whose home base really is around Persepolis in southwestern present-day Iran. But the empire is made up of a huge number of different ethnic groups speaking their own languages with their own religions in different provinces, everywhere from Egypt in the west through to present-day Uzbekistan in the northeast and present-day Pakistan uh, in the, the, the southeast as well. So it's an area that doesn't necessarily have a lot culturally linking it together. Now, the Persians do have a very efficient administration, which is rung in the Aramaic language. They have regional centres which are ruled by Persian governors, but it's an area where we can imagine that there are tensions between the regions and the, the central authority and areas in which someone like Alexander coming in might potentially be able to break pieces off or play to loyalties. And Diana Spencer, Alexander conquered Egypt 
relatively easily. Why was that? I think Egypt was ripe for the taking, really. Um, the Egyptians were not happy subjects of the Persian Empire. Rachel mentioned it's a, it's a very heterogeneous collection of, of peoples and ethnicities. And the Egyptians had not long been, um, been subject to Persia. They weren't keen on Persian domination. They had a proud history of their own, of course, um, of imperialism before their, uh, their decline. So when Alexander, after Tyre and after making his way down the coast of Asia Minor, when he reaches Egypt, he's actually welcomed as a liberator rather than as a conqueror. So it's a very different dynamic to you know, the dynamic Paul was talking about in Tyre. But what does Egypt give him? Egypt gives him um, all sorts of things. It gives him um, credibility as somebody who has conquered a major albeit in slightly uh, straightened circumstances, former world power. It gives him a, a kind of a cultural boost because, of course, Egypt is famously a, a very deeply cultured civilization, very wealthy civilization. So it gives him access to a new uh, sort of source of supplies, so a new way of having a, a supply base that isn't requiring him to send back to Greece. And, of course, the Romans later were going to find Egypt had a very similar sort of focus for their um, imperialism. But what I think it does, um, perhaps most interestingly from my point of view, um, personally, is it, it seems to be the trigger point for some of the things that will come back to haunt Alexander later on, issues around the notion of him being a divine um, descendant of Achilles and Hercules coalesce around the figure of Jupiter Ammon or Zeus Ammon. It's a local Egyptian deity known as Ammon who the Greeks assimilate to or, or imagine is, is similar to their chief god Zeus. Paul Cutledge, it was a huge expedition and there were all sorts of battles, as you said, snowy mountain tops and there was going to be guerrilla warfare when we get to Afghanistan and so on. But was there one decisive battle against the Persian king Darius? There was indeed and um, it took place near what's today Irbil, which is the modern pronunciation of Arbella. And how old would Alexander be then? Alexander in 331 was 25. I came to the throne age 20, as you say, so we've been campaigning for three years. He started out when he was 22. And um, Gorgamila is a flat plain in northern Iraq, and Darius, Darius III, was waiting for Alexander. And it's always a question. He'd been in Egypt, and actually he'd s done something rather strange in Egypt, which uh, you mentioned Zeus Ammon. Well, it, Zeus Ammon has uh, a famous shrine in the far western side of uh, Egypt, really towards Libya in the desert, uh, in an oasis called Siwa. So what on earth was Alexander doing, going on this very dangerous side trip, 250 kilometers, when Darius is waiting for him in um, Iraq, as we would call it? Why doesn't he get over over the um, Euphrates and take him on. Well, it's part of Ar Alexander's charm and um, mystique that he was uh, concerned to get the gods on his side and to prove to his troops they were going to win because the gods were on Alexander's side. They deserted, as it were, uh, the Persians. So he crosses the Euphrates, he marches up into um, the plain and he's faced um, with something of the order of now figures are always inflated. The sources are all Greek, they're not Persian, so they tend to enlarge them. But uh, the figure given is something over a million. Well, we think probably 200, 300,000. Even so, absolutely vastly over numbers, outnumbers Alexander's troops of 50,000, something like that. And uh, Alexander, therefore, has a major morale problem, which he solves. And uh, I think it was Napoleon who said that the morale factor to all other factors in warfare is as three to one. The morale factor is three times as important as all the other factors in warfare. So he's up against uh, elephants. He's up against scythed chariots. He's up against huge outnumbering uh, of forces. And yet he wins. Um, Can we go to you, Rachel? What how did he win? We've heard about his strategies and his inventions, his generalship. Can you give us what was he doing that was so much better than what anybody else was doing? Well, he's doing things that are, that are a lot better than, than other people are doing in some ways, but there are areas where I think it's important to remember that Alexander did face very formidable opposition that he wasn't necessarily capable of withstanding in the way that he had But he hoped. won this battle that Paul's been describing. Yes, yes he did. Um, well, so how did he do it, hmm. if it was, say, 50,000 against 250,000? I think an important factor is what Paul's already mentioned, which is the Macedonian military technology and military training. The equipment they're using 
the discipline among the troops and also the, the factor of morale being extremely important as when well. When you say this technology, is, is it these long 18-foot spears that again was yes, mentioned Yes, yes, using the sarissa and the formation of marching and fighting in those as well. And that did the trick? Apparently so. <laughs> what sort of victory was it? Was it did, did Darius flee the field and so on? Yes. Um, Darius, after his major defeats, uh, as, as a ruler, really loses a lot of authority. Now, the Persian Empire itself fights on for quite a long time, but Darius is deposed by one of his own governors, a, a guy called Bessos, and is uh, captured and taken off in chains by Bessos in the... Uh, flight of the main Persian army up into Central Asia, into what's now Afghanistan. Now, we've been talking very fluently about what you did, Diana Spencer, but what I get from reading what you've all uh, written is that the evidence is patchy. So can you just tell the listeners how patchy it is? Uh, I mean, as it were, own up. <laughs> <laughs> own up to the fact that we're all spinning stories here. Um, I mean, I... I think before I say what evidence we do have, it's interesting just to mention a couple of very famous omissions that we, we think existed but we no longer have. And one of the most important is um, the history of the campaign that was apparently written as the campaign was progressing by Alexander's official historian, Callisthenes. And Callisthenes is an interesting figure because he's the nephew of Aristotle, who Rachel mentioned um, was Alexander's tutor. But does that still exist? That doesn't still exist, I'm afraid. But some of the historians that we do have claim to have seen it or claim to have used it. The other thing that no longer exists, but that we believe did exist, was something that was a sort of daily log of the campaign, a day book in effect. That also is gone, but again we believe that some of the first wave of historians will have been consulting it. The first it. wave of historians was several hundred years later. Well, the, the very first wave of historians may actually have been very close to Alexander, so men such as Ptolemy, for example. So Ptolemy, who goes on to become king of Egypt, making his capital in Alexandria. But we have records from him, do we? We don't actually have records from him. I know this is starting to get terrible, isn't it? But yep. we, what, we, what we understand to be Ptolemy's history is most clearly represented in the history of Arian. Which is when? And Arian is writing in the, the 200s um, AD. So that's three or Second four hundred years. Later, as I suggested. Well, late, yeah. late first, early second, yeah. yes. So how bad does it get, Paul? Um, it depends what you're looking for. I mean, I'm a fan of Arian. Not everybody is. He modelled himself on Xenophon, and he actually called himself Xenophon, but he was writing in the first half of the uh, second century. He was both Greek and Roman, as it were. He came from what's now Turkey, but he was a consul in Rome, and he was archon in Athens and so on. Well, he used Ptolemy. He also used a guy called Aristobulus, who was uh, an engineer or an architect, for example, was asked by Alexander to repair the temple, the tomb of uh, Cyrus, the founder of the Persian Empire at Pasargatai. But the general drift of what you've been saying, you, you tell listeners this is reliable enough or reliable? Well, I think as, as Diana just suggested, historians always write influenced by their own times and the things that are going on in their own culture and society. Um, but if I can add a word of not necessarily support, but empathy for ancient historians. They're engaged in the same project that a lot of us as historians in the present day are. We work with the primary sources that we have as close to the time that we're writing about. We work with secondary sources and we build our own construction of events based on that. And uh, unfortunately, a lot of the primary sources from close to the date of Alexander don't survive. So we can hope or uh, deconstruct in the hope that these historians have worked with these sources and used them well. Paul, back to Paul Cartledge. After the Persian heartlands, um, Alexander, I suppose by then known as the Invincible, or coming known as the Great, moved towards India. Yeah. What did he expect to find? What did he think he was doing? Well, he moved there, of course, via uh, Afghanistan. And the thought is that this had once been part of the Persian Empire, founded by Cyrus, which achieved its greatest expansion in the second half of the 6th century, but by this time was beyond the purview of um, the Persians. So, so what's he doing? Well, there is one strategic um, explanation which is not often thought of, which is that any empire has to have frontiers. And though Alexander seems to have been more keen than most to expand them, you know, to go on forever, nevertheless, you have to be worrying all the time about what's next just beyond your frontier. The Roman Empire is a classic case of this. Why did Julius Caesar invade Britain, for example? So the strategic explanation of the Indian campaign is that he's wrapping up 
his eastern frontier. The romantic explanation, which is, of course, what the sources go for, Heracles had been there, Dionysus had been there, I'm going to go there, and um, therefore it's unnecessary. And since some of the fighting in what's today, of course, now Pakistan, Kashmir, involved extremely unpleasant um, repression of local troops, local peoples who were not keen to be reincorporated in an empire of the West, as they would have seen it. Um, therefore, this is unnecessary. This is Alexander showboating and merely gratifying his own base instincts for slaughter. Well, that hasn't, isn't my view, but it is a view. Dan Spencer. I mean, I think Paul's mention there of the romantic view of, of this um, extension into India also finds strong resonances in, in Roman rhetoric. And actually, the Romans speculated quite extensively as to whether what Alexander really wanted to do was to find the encircling ocean that, that was the final boundary, the final frontier. Yes, the idea was that the, the, the landmass was encircled by one sea and he was going to get Exactly. There. So yeah. that, that, that kind of notion that Alexander was somebody who wanted to go beyond even where Dionysus and, and Heracles yeah, yeah. had gone. On, someone who was going to push the boundaries of reality as well as of, of fact. Can I ask you, Rachel, and people, what was his state of mind? We have this man still young, he's still in his middle late twenties, he's marched uh, for thousands of miles already with this, as Paul has pointed out at the very beginning of the programme, with incredibly, and you pointed out, drilled army which is winning and winning and winning and winning. Um, what's his state of mind? What, who does he think he is? Mm. That's the big question. Yeah. Has, has he lost touch with reality, I suppose, would be another way of putting it. Um, and I'd add to what Paul and Diana have been saying about the campaigns in India and Central Asia, that he's facing a local enemy at this point, but he's also facing opposition from within his own army, which in some ways he's out of touch with. So in Central Asia, uh, he is reduced, he spends three years there, which is an incredibly long time for what essentially are hill tribes and small non urbanized groups of people. He ends up having to, to leave the place garrisoned with small groups of Greek and Macedonian soldiers who absolutely hate being there. And this is something that the ancient sources are very clear on. The geographer Strabo, writing later, says that you can't grow olives in Central Asia. And I suppose we could use that as a benchmark of what, to an ancient Greek, is, is a definition of a civilised place to live. Um, so he's got opposition potentially building there. And when there's a rumour that Alexander has been killed in India, in fact, he was only wounded, all of these Greeks revolt and attempt to return to the Mediterranean. And as he gets into India, this opposition within the army builds until the point at which he finally has to turn back. It, I think it's important to remember it's not just the opposition of local people, the difficulties of the supply chain and terrain and climate, it's also the fact that his army will go no further. And it's also to do with his behaviour uh, and the way, as we, as we learned, from, what I learned from what you've written, can you briskly take us through what he was doing that earned the disrespect of the army that had led to so many victories. Yeah, you've got to distinguish between the inner court and the troops as a whole. And uh, I'll just single out um, one episode which to me is quite extraordinary. And this is, we're now coming quite a long way down. Yeah. We're coming to 324 BC. We're in Susa. He's done all this stuff in the east, far east, and he's come back to Iran. And he decides to hold a mass wedding, a kind of moony wedding. Uh, allegedly 10,000 of his troops who had been in a relationship with an oriental woman of some sort, a camp follower, their re uh, relations are solemnized and Alexander gives them presents. He's extremely rich. But more important than that is that he and about 70 of his closest companions, Greeks, Macedonian Greeks and others, marry Persian women. And uh, Rachel was talking about the three years that he's in uh, what we call Afghanistan. Well, one of the things that happened there was extraordinarily um, important and very odd. He marries um, a Bactrian woman um, called, of course, Rock Ruxani, Ruxana today, and this is his first of three wives. His next two wives are Persians, high-ranking Iranian royal women. He never marries a Greek woman. He marries consecutively and um, at the same time three Oriental women, and he has this mass wedding saying, what's going on? Well, to me, this is extraordinarily un-Greek. It is most far-sighted and most 
inclusive. He is not normal. He has a vision which is beyond that which, as far as I know, anybody had ever expressed. Aristotle thought all non-Greeks were barbarians fit mainly to be slaves. And, and this is part of a, a wider potentially programme or unintentional programme of, of Persianising that Alexander is going through at this time as well. One very, very controversial thing he does is introduce a practice called proskinesis in the Greek, which is a Persian habit of bowing down before the ruler, completely flat, prostrating yourself. Now, good democratic or semi-democratic Greeks, th this is something that's completely revolting to them, and it's very, very controversial for Alexander to do this. And in fact, there, there is a strain in modern historiography that suggests that Alexander is not just the, the first ruler of a new Hellenistic Greek Middle East, uh, he's also the last ruler of the, the Persian Empire in the old style as well, maintaining many of their traditions. Now, there's also tales in your mouths about him becoming a tremendous drunk and even killing one of his best friends at a dinner party because he was drunk. What evidence do you have and how does that play in, Diana? Well, I think, you know, there is almost no evidence apart from our, our, our Roman historians in effect. But I think what, what we're seeing with these stories of, of increasingly drunken rages or eccentric aberrant behaviour, if they're true, we're seeing instances really of what, what Paul and Rachel have just been talking about, this sense that as the 320s were going on, Alexander was turning into something other than a Macedonian ruler. So we could start with the plot um, that supposedly was um, happening earlier in the 320s, um, which one of... Alexander's inner circle, a general called Philotas, supposedly knew about but didn't tell him about and obviously decided to hedge his bets, stay on the sidelines, perhaps. Alexander finds out about the plot and has Philotas executed, tried and executed. He then had to have Philotas' father, another very senior um, general in the, the, the team, Parmenion, executed because, of course, you couldn't allow the father to stay alive when the son has been executed for treason. So that starts a kind of a process of distancing Alexander from his central, his core team that, that Paul was talking about. And this starts to become increasingly evident when we see stories like the one you just mentioned of Clitus. Clitus, a very old family friend, in effect, someone who was uh, related to the nurse that that brought him up as a child. Clitus has been with him all the way through the campaigns. And Clitus is, in the sources, a plain speaker. He's somebody from the old country who believes that he needs to give Alexander a word or two to tell him where he's going wrong. Unfortunately, he chooses a banquet at which a lot of drink has been taken in order to, to make this point. And he says, you know, Alexander, you need to get back a hold of yourself. You're becoming a Persian. You're no longer one of us. Alexander is incensed and he actually um, stabs him with a spear and kills him as part of the banquet. And then Alexander himself is killed. Is it assassination, Paul, or what is it? Yes, well, this is the million-dollar question. Did he die of natural causes, that is, say, malaria as a result of uh, lots of wounds and an infection, or was it a plot amongst his inner circle? Was he poisoned? Um, I think the jury is out. Um, maybe my friends have um, very strong views, but I think probably on the whole more likely is that he died of natural causes in the sense that partly self inflicted, that's to say the terrible wounds that he had suffered front, back, everywhere, and he was weak uh, by the time that um, this uh, infection uh, seized upon him and it was deadly. He'd nearly died several times before. But he turned back, but instead of going back the easy way, he went back by ah. as difficult a way as he could manage. What did he do that for, Paul? Well, you're quite right. And this is part of the showboating in India. This, this um, supports the view that the Indian um, campaign was merely showboating, and therefore to choose the more difficult way rather than the easy way back along the Makran, along the Persian Gulf, where there wasn't any water, and where um, it's desert conditions and so on. Well, that was just crazy, and a lot of his troops died. But um, I I have no more comment than that, that um, he, he could have argued that he wanted to link up with his fleet. One of his mm. oldest friends was um, educated with him uh, as a youth, and Niarchos was a Greek from Crete, and he was in charge of the navy. And so you could argue that the navy and the army should um, keep in sync. Uh, there are you know, rational arguments you can make as well as irrational. When he died at 32, 33? 32, nearly, 30, nearly 33. When he died at 32, what was, what was thought of him? 
what was his reputation? Paul said invincible, he became yeah. known as the great. Do we have sources which are accurate enough to tell us what people thought of him at that time? I think the really telling thing is what, is what happens to Alexander's body after his death. Um, there, there is a notion that uh, he, he, dies in, he dies in Babylon, and there's a notion that the appropriate thing would be for his body, his funeral cortege, to go to Macedonia for him to be buried with his ancestors. What happens is that very quickly after Alexander's death, his generals par uh, parcel up temporary control of the empire between them, and Ptolemy, one of Alexander's closest companions from childhood, gets Egypt. Now, Ptolemy has long-term ambitions in Egypt. He does end up founding a dynasty which concludes with the, the famous Cleopatra. And what Ptolemy does is hijacks Alexander's funeral cortege and brings the body to Alexander's city of Alexandria in northern Egypt, where it's set up and gives legitimacy to his dynasty. So whatever people may have thought about him on a per personal level, he's a very important source of legitimacy for the rulers who for follow him. I think it's also interesting to note that as, as Rome starts to expand into what was Alexander's territories in the Mediterranean, the Greek historian Polybius attempting to explain, you know, what has happened, what is this new power doing in the Mediterranean world, that Polybius uses Alexander as a, as a kind of an example or a comparative um, for what, what, what the Roman impact on the Mediterranean could become. So we can see even fairly soon after Alexander's death, he's becoming a model for successive modes of imperialism. And in the Egypt that Ptolemy was ruling, uh, and the Ptolemies ruled, there developed what's called, we call it, the Alexander Romance, which has meant that Alexander features in something like 70-plus national literatures, including, for example, Chaucer and Shakespeare. And I was very sorry he was cut out from the current version of Hamlet, uh, the Barbican. <laughs> but, but this romance means that in art and in literature, Alexander performs all sorts of roles. He's a terrific knight in the Middle Ages. He's an ex explorer, he goes up to heaven, he goes down to the bottom of the sea. He is um, the most famous, probably, single individual, taking it all together the last 2,500 years. Well, thank you all very much. Thank you, Paul Cartlidge, Dinah Spencer and Rachel Mears. Uh, if you have a subject for In Our Time that you think deserves a radio audience and will make Radio 4 listeners in the UK and around the world sit up and take notice, please send your ideas to us through our website by the 29th of October. One of them will be the subject of In Our Time on the 3rd of December. Thank you for listening. And the In Our Time podcast gets some extra time now with a few minutes of bonus material from Melvin and his guests. I, th I mean, I think it's it's very interesting that we've seen Alexander played so unsuccessfully through cinematic adaptation. Um, Why do you think that is? I think I think one of the things that's most complex about Alexander is also what's most interesting about him, which which is that sort of that old thing, which is charisma. You know, how do you yeah, capture yeah. charisma? How do you capture that idea of someone who can speak equally powerfully to troops in the field and also compel powerful, you know, robber barons in effect yeah. from from the, the world of, of Philip and, and his. I think Rossum got wrong the balance between yeah. what was going on in Greece. Uh, he spent the first two thirds of the film getting Alexander to. A Asia, yeah. and therefore the last bit was just too rushed. And it was very studio bound as well. Yeah. I mean, one just didn't oh, well, feel that. Well, that was probably that... technology. I'm Whereas sure it was technology. Oliver Stone in the early 2000s, he has the possibility to do everything. He can stage pitched battles, and he staged two. Um, he goes over to Asia. He has Babylon, all that stuff. Yeah. Which, yeah. Mm. But he couldn't, I think, make... I met Oliver, and uh, I asked him about this, but he couldn't make up his mind whether Alexander was to be admired mm. as a great hero or to be empathised with as a troubled person who mm. wasn't quite happy killing lots of people, but he was very sensitive and he had this wonderful relationship with Hephaestion and he wasn't, in other words, the brutal conqueror, which mm. I think most of my colleagues, you may be exceptions, but most of my colleagues now, I think, take a very negative view mm. of Alexander, partly because we're not wildly keen on imperialism these mm. days. Mm. You know, we just don't have that empathetic view that it's okay in its Itself to wish to rule lots and lots of other people. What do your students think? Well, some of them begin the term by, by talking about Alexander in the terms of the, the greatest conqueror the world has ever seen. Mm. And once I've explained that we don't use that phrase, uh, we, we... Why did you use it? Well, because it, <laughs> it, doesn't, it doesn't ask any questions. It's completely unnuanced. It starts with an assumption and it also starts with the, the idea that this is in some way a competition. 
that you know there there is a greatest and a second greatest and a third greatest and so forth and i think alexander is a, a wonderful teaching tool in a lot of ways because he's so complex and nuanced the sources are tricky to work with and he's he's a figure that a lot of people project things onto so it's He's a useful figure for making students think about what they're bringing to the interpretation of the subject. What is it that they are looking for in, in the past? I mean, I think you're, you're spot on, actually, Rachel, in, in that idea that, that we have always, I say we, you know, people have always projected their own fears, anxieties, desires onto Alexander. And I think that's, that's in part because of all of the things that we've been saying in a way over the last sort of hour or so, which, which is that he was, he was a radically different brand of leader even in his own time and I think that that has really percolated to us through other radical brands of imperialism um, which have picked up on the notion of a charismatic central figure who is at the same time kind of one of the people and the Romans pick up on that very vividly but other popular imperializing movements or, or movements that started as, as popular anyway Napoleon I think Paul mm. mentioned earlier Egypt, Egypt of course you yeah. know picks up on Alexander very vividly and again there's that kind of issue of someone who starts off one of the people part of a revolutionary movement but becomes an establishment figure to be this you know, this dissolute figure that, that comes oh, out, is, yeah. is there much evidence for that? Was he... I mean, I can see yeah. him becoming a Persian yeah. potentate because yeah. he wants yeah. to... A tyrant, because yeah. of, and I think Paul explained that very well, that yeah. he's going beyond what had gone before. But the idea of being um, a sort of drunk at a, yeah. at a yeah. party and murdering his best friend, you think, oh, was it, did that really well? Did that, what evidence is for that murder of his good friend? I don't think we have any direct evidence. What we have evidence through is, is the works of someone like Arian, as, yeah. as Paul was yeah. mentioning. I mean, it wouldn't be possible to make that up um, no. because Clytus was, as you said, so closely yeah. involved and yeah. actually he saved yeah. Alexander's life exactly. at, the, at the first okay. battle yeah. of the Granicus. And, and there, there is an established Macedonian tradition of getting very drunk at parties, yeah. so yeah. that's not yeah. surprising. Is that Macedonian? Is that where it comes from? Do we owe it to Macedonia? Yes, I think we can blame the Macedonians. But I think there's also the issue that, you know, you're, you're on campaign there are probably issues with water and with availability of water but you're carrying wine with you mm. um, so you actually potentially are, are more likely get to get quicker. to get high quicker yeah, you're not yeah. you'd have no potential to mess necessarily to mix your wine mm. in the way that you would expect as, mm. a, as a Greek so I think you know th there might have been I suppose functional reasons why there was more drinking going on even over and above Macedonian cultural practices well Victoria comes in the producer too